welcome to The Muslim View. I'm your host, Sarah Darsha. Uh, today we have a very special guest joining us at the Islamic Center, Sister Susie Ismail. Uh, she's joining us from New Jersey, and she's a motivational speaker and an author of many issues uh, regarding Muslims in our community. So join us today as we listen to her lectures and have an interview with her. So we had the, the luxury, and we want to thank Sister Effa for, uh, for bringing this uh, concept to us. And the way it started was we were having a discussion about divorce and marriage and a lot of the problems that, that happen with young couples in our community. Um, and so if I said, you know what, I, I've been reading about this wonderful uh, lady in, in the United States. She would be wonderful to bring to London uh, to speak to us and that uh, we could learn from her. Um, and and this, this sister is Sister Susie Asmaid. Susie Asmaid is one of the best things about her is she's like me, she's Egyptian. Um, but, uh, but more importantly, um, she's, uh, she's an Egyptian, but she's a, a young Muslim who raised in the United States. So she's like us. And she understands the problems and the issues um, that, that uh, our generation, and the younger generations, uh, deal with on a day to day basis. Um, and uh, she's written several books. She lives in uh, New Jersey. A lot of her books centered around um, marriage and Islam, divorce and Islam. And she's also the founder of Cornerstone, um, which is, and that's why we're a little bit late starting. We're having a wonderful discussion inside about the wonderful marriage counseling and youth counseling and the services that they provide for uh, many of the Muslims and the youth in, uh, in New Jersey. So the topic we're going to talk about today is finding balance, understanding our gender roles, understanding modesty, and seeing how it relates to our activism and our identities. Living here in the West today, it is crucial that we understand who we are before we try to share our identity with anyone else. If we don't know who we are, if we don't know where we're going, the message we're going to give out to the world is one that's going to be very confused. And so we have to know who we are and where we stand to be those solid Muslims, to be those strong Muslims, to be the ambassadors of our faith that are going to teach the world what it means to be a Muslim and what it means to be a strong Muslim living in the West. So before we begin anything, any time we run into an individual, whether from our own faith or from another faith, the first decision that's made is decision made purely based on what we look like. And this is incredibly important for us to understand. And in order to understand it, I want us all to do a little exercise. I want you all to raise your left hand. Now I want you to put your left hand down. I want you to raise up your right hand. Now put your right hand down. I want you to put your left hand on your head. Now I want you to put your left hand on your cheek. How many of you put your hand on your forehead instead of your cheek? I, I was going to say, I saw the imam. <laughs> I know, I saw the imam. <laughs> okay. All right. Imam, why did you put your hand on your forehead instead of your cheek? You don't know. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to tell you why. Because what we see is more powerful than what we hear. That even though I told you to put your hand on your cheek, because I put my hand on my forehead right off the bat, Either you followed and put your hand on your forehead, or you questioned it for a moment. You sat there wondering, wait, should I put it on my cheek? Should I put it on my forehead? Even though I clearly said cheek. And this is how we live our lives. We walk through our worlds telling people, I am this, I am this, I am this. But if the world doesn't see this and this and this from us, they won't believe it. So we can say, I am a strong Muslim. We can say, I believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can say, I am modest. But if the world doesn't see that, then the world won't believe it. So it's so important that we act upon what we say and that we say what we act upon. Now, one of the most difficult aspects that I see, you know, in the line of work that I do, not only do I get to um, speak about the topic of marriage and divorce and relationships, 
but I also get to speak to a lot of youth, and I travel to a lot of different college campuses and high schools to talk to the youth about different topics related to them. And invariably, one of the most common topics I'm invited to speak about is the topic of gender relations. What does it mean to be a Muslim male? What does it mean to be a Muslim female? And how do we interact with each other? We're told that every faith has one defining characteristic. And in the faith of Islam, the defining characteristic of our deen is al-hayat, or modesty. And it's so important that we understand what it means to be modest and how that affects our roles as both men and women, and as both boys and girls, and as youth when we're going through those difficult teenage years. We'll be back with more with Sister Susie Ismail. Stay tuned. Welcome to the new Backmaster Chevrolet. We've recently expanded to serve you better and now offer a 45 minutes or less loop, oil and filter service. Our selection of over 330 new and pre-owned vehicles will give you plenty of choice when selecting your next vehicle. And our team of highly trained GM certified technicians will ensure your vehicle runs smoothly day in and day out. See what all the bus is about. Make your move to Backmaster today. Welcome back to the show. Let's continue with Sister Susie Ismaili joining us all the way from New Jersey. One of the topics that we often talk about when we're discussing gender roles and diversity is the issue of the way that a Muslim dresses. Because without a doubt, talking about the visual that we often get, the first visual that people will often get of a Muslim woman is a woman who wears hijab, or a woman who is wearing modest clothing. And for a man, often the first visual is a man who has a beard, or a man who is wearing modest clothing. And that visual says something to the person who's making the judgment. But even though we're quick to point out that society will make up excuses or will make up a slurs or say things that are negative about the way we dress, internally in our own Muslim communities, we sometimes experience it as well. Because when we try to define what it means to be a Muslim man or a Muslim woman in terms of human definitions, we always stumble. How many of you have ever been through a lecture and you heard someone speaking about the hijab and comparing a Muslim woman to a pearl and saying that the Muslim woman is like a pearl who is covered by the oyster, who is under the, the sand in the bottom of the ocean and because she is so precious, this is why she wears hijab. Have you heard that? Okay. You've heard that? Just now. <laughs> well, prior to just now. <laughs> prior to just now. We've heard that. Other things that we've heard, you know, the Muslim woman is like a flower. She blossoms very briefly. And I'll never forget, you know, this is a little bit of a side note, but I'll never forget that when I was about 19 years old, I was at a, a friend's wedding, and I remember an auntie had come up to me, and she said to me, how old are you, Beka? And I said, I'm 19. And she said, oh, the girl is like a flower. She blossoms at 18, and then she withers and dies. You must get married. <laughs> and I remember that very clearly, that the analogy is sometimes made that the woman is like the flower. But again, this is a human definition. It's not a definition that we've been given by our faith. It's not a definition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. One of the most recent definitions I've seen in humans trying to explain the concept of modesty, the concept of hayat, or the concept of hijab even, is the example that if you took two lollipops, one had a covering on it, and one did not have the cover. And you throw them both on the ground and you pick them up. Which lollipop are you going to want to take? The covered one, right? And this is why Muslim women wear hijab. So I don't know about you, but personally, I don't feel like I should be compared to a flower or a pearl or a candy. Because again, that's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told me I am. And you know, just so that the boys don't feel left out, so the men don't feel left out. And um, there's another analogy that goes around comparing the Muslim man to the kiwi. That if you had a kiwi that and you took off the outer shell, and you know you had a kiwi that kept the outer shell on, the, the hairy part on, and you threw them both on the ground, which one would you rather eat? The one that has the hairy shell on it or the one without? The one with the hairy shell. 
And this is why Muslim men have beards. <laughs> Again, absolutely ridiculous, right? And to the rational mind, we listen to this and we're like, it doesn't really make sense, you know? And you're right, it doesn't make sense. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what it means to be a Muslim man and a Muslim woman. He tells us what it means to be a modest man and a modest woman. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not tell us that we are like those inanimate objects. Instead, He elevates our status and He explains to us that whether we are a Muslim man or a Muslim woman, we will have that same reward. When we look at Surah Al-Ahzab, we see the translation of this ayah and it says, Indeed the Muslim men and the Muslim women, the believing men and the believing women, the obedient men and the obedient women, the truthful men and the truthful women, the patient men and the patient women, the humble men and the humble women, the charitable men and the charitable women, the fasting men and the fasting women, the men who guard their chastity and the women who do so, and the men who remember Allah often and the women who do so. For them, Allah has prepared forgiveness and a great reward. So in this ayah, we see that whether we're male or female, man or woman, boy or girl, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will judge us not by what we look like, not by our gender, but by the merit of our deeds, by the good that we do for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the obedience that we pledge to Him. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created each and every one of us on this earth for one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to worship Him. So that every act that we take and every step that we take in this dunya can become an act of worship if we take that step with the intention of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as we're growing up in our families, we're growing up in families who sometimes may not fully understand where we're coming from. We're growing up in societies and communities that may sometimes point fingers and tell us that we're different, we're not the same. And as we saw internally within our own community sometimes, we feel like we're not fully understood. But as we go through the roles that we have in our lives, whether it's you know, in the role of being a Muslim, a Muslim, a husband or a wife, a father or a mother, an employer, an employer, and so on and so forth. We'll be back with more of Sister Susie Ismail. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Muslim View. We have a very special guest with us today, Sister Susie Ismail. Join us as she talks to us a little bit about relationships and marriage. I know some of the parents, I was born here. I was raised here. And I saw the struggles my parents went through. And it was a little unfair for my generation because with our parents, it was either you were Muslim or you were Canadian. And it was very, very difficult to be both. Um, but alhamdulillah, my generation, and I'm sure all of you know this new generation, because I'm dealing with my own, my own children, is that they develop their identity of being Canadian Muslim. There is no, you can marry the two very, very, very easily and be fully Muslim and be fully Canadian also. And inshallah, your children, my, my children's generation will develop that. And that's how, how we succeed inshallah. Would you agree with that? So we want to thank Sister Susie, uh, Sister Susie, for her wonderful talk. Um, when, inshallah, tomorrow at tomorrow's lecture, the, the topic is going to be about marriage and Islam. She will talk a little bit about all of the wonderful work that she's doing. And only in the five minutes that I, I listened to her, we I, we learned that there's something very important we need to bring into our community here in London. Inshallah, hopefully, Sister Susie will help us with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sister Susie, for coming all the way from uh, New Jersey. And uh, we hope we get to hear some more enlightening words tomorrow, inshallah. as alaykum. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to The Muslim View. I'm your host, Sarah Darsha. Today we have a very special guest, Sister Susie Ismail, joining us all the way from New Jersey. She's an author and a motivational speaker. Uh, welcome to the show, Sister Susie. Thank you so much. It's nice to be here. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Sister Susie, talk to me a little bit about why you're here today and uh, what's your message, inshallah. 
Um, well, a lot of the work that I do is related to communication um, and relationships and understanding who we are as Muslims. Um, so uh, one of the programs that I run out of New Jersey is a center called Cornerstone, which focuses on marriage counseling, marriage facilitation, and youth counseling. Um, so I get to travel quite a bit to uh, speak to people about those types of topics. Um, how can we strengthen our identity? How can we understand our identity? And how can we reflect that identity so that we build the best and uh, most productive relationships, not only within our own homes, but with the outside world as well? Talk to me a little bit about your books. So you have a few um, books out, and some of them are about um, modern modern day marriage, I think it is, or modern marriage in Islam. Um, tell me a little bit about that and what that means. Well, I have uh, several different books. I have uh, some books called the, the BFF Sisters, which is a uh, series for children, which essentially focuses on what it means to be Muslim growing up in the West. Um, and then I have uh, a book called When Muslim Marriage Fails, which is about divorce uh, among Muslim communities, I also in the West, um, and modern Muslim marriage, and uh, nine to five Muslims in the Western workplace. So although my books seem to cover different topics, they're all, again, related to that uh, central issue of relationships and understanding the self before trying to understand anyone else and understanding our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and more foremost, foremost and building um, our relationships with people based on pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so in my books about marriage and divorce, which tend to be the ones that people seem to be most interested in, um, it really just looks at what causes our marriages to uh, either succeed or not succeed um, in a very practical perspective. Because of course we know that everything is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands, but at the end of the day, what can we do as individuals to strengthen our marriages and why do we see so many struggles, um, not only in marriages themselves, but in people trying to get married as well. Um, so the, the, the focus of those books are really just really moving the, the, the centrality of relationships to away from looking at someone else to looking at yourself, first of all, knowing who you are, understanding yourself, understanding your purpose, and then applying that purpose to your relationships. And how do you feel the best way is to, I guess, balance our identity and as Canadians, as Muslims, as Americans? What, what is, are the key points that we need to remember in order to have that balance? I think first and foremost is, is understanding who we answer to. At the end of the day, we answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that as much as we may run across people um, and into people who may try to pull us away from that purpose, constantly grounding ourselves through our salah um, and maintaining that purpose all the time is so important to leading a balanced life. Also recognizing that there's no such thing as 100% balanced all the time. Um, the pendulum always swings in our lives where certain things are more important than other things or seem to be more important than other things, whether it's being pulled by family obligations, work obligations, uh, studying, uh, things of that sort. Um, there, we have to find that balance and the best way to maintain that balance is to prioritize, to recognize that again at the center of everything is the worshipping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and everything kind of falls into place when you organize it with that purpose and that intention in mind. There are some myths about Muslim women and, and Muslims in general. How do you think we can dispel some of the myths, especially about Muslim women? Mashallah, Yani, you're a very strong Muslim woman, a very uh, inspiration to all of us. So what are some things that we can do to dispel these myths um, and kind of open people's eyes to who we truly are? I think it's important for us to just be ourselves. I mean, a lot of times we get caught up in the, you know, what would society say? What would media say? What would our community say? What would our culture say? Um, at the end of the day, all of that what would say doesn't really matter um, as much as what would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say or what would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want us to do in this situation. Um, if we consistently go back to that point, we will be able to find our own voices and we'll be able to speak up. Um, the world is not out to get us, even though we may think that that's the case. Um, at the end of the day, I think to a large extent, the world doesn't understand us. Um, we haven't given the world enough opportunities to see what it means to be a Muslim man or a Muslim woman. Um, and even in the, the few glimpses that we've been able to break through, um, it's been overshadowed by what society or what the media um, decides the definition should be. So it's about taking back our own definitions. Um, and I think to a certain extent, Muslims are still the new kid on the block in the West. You know, We haven't gotten to that point in our lives yet where we can be uh, what the society and, and what people around us see as familiar. We're still unfamiliar. Um, we're still different. And again, there's no fear or no shame in being different, but there is a lot of more hard work that needs to go in to explaining that difference sometimes. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sister Susan. Jazakallah khair. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum.
Welcome to the new MacMaster Chevrolet. We've recently expanded to serve you better and now offer a 45 minutes or less loop, oil and filter service. Our selection of over 330 new and pre-owned vehicles will give you plenty of choice when selecting your next vehicle. And our team of highly trained GM certified technicians will ensure your vehicle runs smoothly day in and day out. See what all the bus is about. Make your move to Backmaster today. Welcome back to the show. Let's continue with Sister Susie Ismaie joining us all the way from New Jersey. We're here with Sister Ifat Faruqi. Welcome to the show again. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Ifat, what did you think today of the uh, the lecture? It was an excellent resource. Like, um, alhamdulillah, we were able to invite her to the center. And um, it was really, really helpful. I Not only I was thinking it would benefit the youth, but I think it individually, ourselves, even though you've been married for 15, 20 years, whatever, I think it's helping us. I picked up a few points too as well for hopefully a better marriage, a happy marriage. So um, I wish there were many more people here who could attend and could benefit, but I'm sure if we watch a um, lecture on your channel or um, you know anywhere else on YouTube or whatever, um, we'll be much more um, beneficial for all of us, I think. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. We have Sister Afia with us today. Welcome to the show, Sister Afia. Thank you so much for having me here. Afia, what did you think of today's lecture with Sister Susie Ismail? Well, actually, it was my first time meeting her, and I loved it. Being a married woman for myself, only two years, on, actually on Tuesday, I learned a lot. And definitely, definitely, uh, I'm going to recommend her to anybody. It was so much learning that you can't learn from your family. You can't learn from your parents. Like she said, third person has to be in there teaching you just to, to give a guideline, guideline, like, you know. And, uh, like, it was beautiful, alhamdulillah. <laughs> What types of points did she talk about that kind of hit home for you or were very inspirational for you? Like like she said, if both partners are working, they have to come home and be partners as well. It just can't be the wife like, oh, you do this, you do this, you're the girl, you're the female, it's your job. Or even a communication. I find that we, especially in Pakistani couples, don't have communication. It's always the male ego and then the female. But uh, definitely communications. I loved that. Another thing was to say, give that five minutes to each other like that five minutes to just let it out and be you know but uh, there's the many other thing if I go on <laughs> it'll take forever but these three things like I think are gonna make a difference to my relationship definitely thank you so much for joining us today thank you so much for having me thank you so much alaikum. that's it for the Muslim view thank you for joining us I'm your host Sarah Darsha we'll see you next time